cotton aqua bee paper and I did happen to upload my picture and made it into a little with the supply list and then I also took it did it in black and white and then I uploaded that to my computer and made myself some traceables so you've got lots of options you can make it any size that you would like we've got this is the size here that I used and what I did was I took the six by nine paper aqua bee paper fold it in half and then I taped it in on with some washi tape as to where I wanted it and I just took my graphite transfer paper slipped that underneath and then took my pen and traced over that and took out the graphite paper and disengage this and you can see I've got a nice tracing nice and light but we are going to go over it with our micron pen I've got the 0.5 and it's black and this type of pen is um, waterproof which is really really important when you are working with watercolor so after I traced it and I'm hoping that y'all had a chance to trace it so we'll just give everybody kind of a minute to catch up get their tracing in and then we will go over it with the pen I'm gonna get this out of here also Free up my space, try and get a little more light. This time of year it's kind of tough because you just don't know what your light situation is going to be like. If anybody logs in and watches, I may just end up doing it again as a YouTube video here. I'm in a room that has light on 270 degrees on three out of four walls and it's still not light in here so here you can see the tracing it's really light because it is on the watercolor paper you guys can go ahead and send in any text me any questions that you have they should show up on my feed and I will be able to answer you So we'll just take our pen here and lightly go over and I just did this for a little extra depth. I'm trying to be a little bit sketchy and not also because this is a 140 pound cold press paper there is a little bit of texture to it. So the lines will not be perfect and I don't want them to be perfect anyway. If they end up being a little bit heavier in some areas and a little bit lighter in others, don't worry about it. I'm going to try and move that light so I can get rid of that shadow from my hand. I'm not being, like I said, super precise with this. We just want kind of a loose, sketchy look. You can't go too quickly with these pens on this watercolor paper because the texture of the paper kind of catches on the pen. Get a little shadow underneath that pumpkin, a little bit of texture from the ground that it's sitting on. So 
So I'm just going to keep doing this and I hope everybody is following along and doing the same thing. Or maybe you already had yours already outlined. So these are some little sunflowers that I did. You can see them there. Here's a stem from our pumpkin. We're going to do that so it looks like it's been twisted a little bit. So I'm going to put the directional lines in there. Oh, we can get rid of this. This was just some washi tape that I used. I like the washi tape because it doesn't hurt the paper at all. It doesn't pull up any of the fibers from the paper. show so if you ever looked at a stem from a pumpkin it's kind of twisted up a little bit so we'll do it so it's got a little bit of texture and it's kind of twisted and we've got this leaf down here And another little leaf here. A little leaf here. This paper is a six by nine paper and I just took it and folded it in half. It seems to be kind of the perfect size if you're gonna make cards. And then you can either leave it folded like a card or you can tear it in half. That way you can mount it onto another piece of cardstock so you're not using your expensive watercolor paper for your basically your cardstock. This is the center of our sunflower. They have that little divot in the middle. They also have kind of some little dots. I'll try to not make too many dots because it bounces my camera. The back side leaves and the calyx. And we got a little lit back layer of leaves here. And there are some little textured veins in the petals. They will always be radiating out from the center of the flower.
And you can certainly draw this out yourself if you want with a mechanical pencil. It's a really simple basic shape. I think everybody kind of knows what a pumpkin looks like. They all have these segments here. So you just do your center oval and then you can just do your segments coming off from that. You make your pumpkin as big or as round or as fat as you want. So there we just have a nice little drawn out sketch that we're going to use to fill in and that will give us a little bit of extra depth and kind of gives us a head start with our painting which is always good to have, have a head start. I'm going to just put in a few very loose kind of blades of grass maybe coming up, fill in some of this extra area here. I'm going to move this. So I'm going to give you guys a few seconds to finish up yours as well. All right, so I hope everybody had a chance to fill in their pumpkin. I am going to zoom in a little bit here, and that way you will be able to see closer up of what I am doing. We'll try and get this little guy here into the frame also. Okay, so tonight I'm going to be using the Sennelier paints. This is a really, really economical way to get very expensive Sennelier paints. So a 24 set of Sennelier paints runs about um, $150 minimum for a 24 set. But they happen to have this special one out that you can get a 12 plus six free. And this particular set with the 12 plus six is only about is $68 at both Blick and Jerry's Artorama. And they do have free shipping as well. At Jerry's, you don't even have to pay tax because it's coming out of Texas. And then what I did was at Blick, you can order individual half pans and you can fill in your extra colors because it comes with enough plate, enough space in the pan for 24 but they're only giving you 18 so here is the color sheet that comes with it and then what I did was I bought additional half pans that come in their own little um, package like this and they're already in the half pan and then that way you can end up with a 24 set and the half pans at Blick end up being between five and six dollars each. So it cost me $98 for anywhere from $150 to a $200 set of Sennelier paints. These paints have a little bit of honey in them. They're made in France. They're all hand poured. They're really, really nice. They're very transparent, very translucent. And like I said, this company has been around for over a hundred years very well respected and a really sought after 
paint for watercolorists. Another thing is that the pan was just long enough that I was able to sneak an extra half pan or on either side here and I'm going to fill one of these with some white gouache because I always like having some white gouache and then I thought I'd either use a um, gold or a silver interference that I would fill into that one too and just always have a little bit of a metallic kind of a pearl for an accent so these are the paints we're going to use and I do have the colors listed on the event um, we're going to be using the lemon yellow the Sennelier orange um, all of your burnt sienna burnt umber your forest green light phthalo green and then this is a really interesting color I didn't use it in this particular painting but I really love it it's an odd color it is called pink brown of all things and it's neither pink nor is it brown it is definitely more like an olivey green it reminds me kind of the underwater green in Daniel Smith and it is a great olivey green for doing foliages and doing shadows on leaves and things like that so that is definitely an extra color that I would pick up if you were thinking about doing something like this with a set of Sennelier this pan comes with the double flip like most of your higher end paints do and I am just going to be using the palette that is attached right on here I'm going to be using these Princeton aqua elite brushes that are from um, I just got them at Michaels they were on sale last week 30% off all their brushes um, these are not the cheapest these are a level 3 brush so they are a little better brush but they still are pretty snappy so as opposed to um, a squirrel brush because these ones are a synthetic you can see they have a little bit more snap they don't hold quite as much water which for someone who's not really used to watercolor or if you are working and doing a little bit more of a tighter style of painting like this is definitely we're kind of keeping it in the lines a little bit more the synthetic brush is great for that because you have a lot lot more control as opposed to something like these um, brushes here that I are a da Vinci um, these are a 100% blue squirrel tail and they make a big deal that they only take from the male squirrels because they have a firmer type of bristle but you can see these ones here are all hand tied they are all handmade from beginning to end I'm sure that some poor little squirrel gave his life for these brushes um, like this little brush here is like $40 on its own um, you can buy all of these together for $40 so you know unless you really want to go into the super heavy duty or you're crazy like me you don't need to have these but they are nice to have if you want to watch um, these are called a mop and they're like I said they're all hand tied this is what is holding the brush together is all this solid brass wire and these babies will hold a ton of water they're a little bit more difficult to control because of that so if you're doing a lot of loose pictures or something where you're doing big washes they are fantastic for that so I might use one of these for doing a little bit of our blending but I'm gonna try and use just the Princeton's so everybody can follow around along another great brush that really works well that's much more affordable is something like um, the silver brush company makes a great brush um, the Princeton heritage is really nice the Cotman Sapphire, the Princeton Neptune. So you've got a lot of great options. You don't have to use a specific brush. Brushes are probably one of the least important things with watercolor. I would definitely say the most important thing is the paper that you're using. Second most important thing would be your paints. And then third would be your brushes. So put your money into your paper and your paint and then take your time with the brushes. So now we are going to start to fill in our little pumpkin here first thing we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit of a background you can kind of see we've got this light blue that I just modeled in I am going to take my spray bottle from the dollar store and spritz my paints to get them activated 
give them a few seconds to work. I did make up a color chart of these colors because when you see them in the pan, it's really difficult to tell. Um, and they, it does go this particular way. I try and keep my chart the same way that my pan is oriented so I know exactly which colors I am going to. I just took some washi tape, separated this out, and did a nice swatch of each color. All right, I've got a pot of water here. I like these nice big square pots. They are left over from my mushrooms. I eat a lot of fresh mushrooms and these little Pans from Aldi's are great because they have a nice big flat bottom, so I don't tend to do one of two things. I don't drink my paint water, and I don't knock it over and spill it. Now watch me knock it over and spill it. All right, so let's get some water on our brush, and we're gonna use this cerulean blue here. Mix it on my palette. I don't worry about cleaning my palette up until, unless I'm doing super precise, tight things. I like and am totally okay with getting some of my colors intermingling. I um, tell myself it gives me good color harmony, but really that's just because I'm lazy. So we're going to take a clean brush with a lot of water on it, and we're just going to tap it around. Around the outside, I am not being very precise as far as going really tight up to up to this at all. So, try and get you guys a good angle there. The camera is adjusting itself on me. So, because this is a, a nice cotton paper, it's going to absorb this B paper. They had discontinued making it for a while because Aqua. B had actually gotten bought out by another company, but there was so much demand for it that the company that bought them has begun to manufacture it again. So I have not gotten any of the new batch. I'm hoping that it is as good as the original was because I really, really like this paper. It's nice because it is 100% cotton, so you don't have to worry so much about blooms and things like that, but it's not as precious as a piece of say arches where it's going to cost you five dollars for you know a nine by twelve sheet of arches so now i have really 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 watered this down this is that cerulean blue and i'm just tapping it in and you can see how it's kind of blending out and blooming and doing its own thing and i am just letting it do that i want to have it a little bit more modeled don't worry if you think that this is a little bit too bright because it is gonna dry considerably lighter than when we initially put it on, but you can always take a tissue or a towel. I just happen to use an old rag and blot up anything that you don't like or that you think is a little bit much. So you see here where I'm getting puddles. I personally kind of like that, especially on this where it's really loose and we're just trying to get in some background color here. I want a little bit more color in some of these areas. I don't want it to be a perfectly smooth, flat looking wash. So once I get my initial swatch of color in there, get a little bit in between some of these petals. I'm gonna pick up a little bit of the paper, the paint right from the pan and it's much darker. Clean off my brush because that is a little heavier than I wanted. Tap it off and just move some of that paint around. And this is the most fun part of your watercolor. Just playing with it like you used to when you were in kindergarten. Now I didn't tape this down. We're not going to be using a ton of water. You can see that it is bowing up on me a little bit. It is going to flatten back out when it dries. And the rest of this is not going to be a, a wet on wet where we're going to be using a lot of water. So I'm not worrying about that. But you absolutely could clip it down onto a clipboard or do, um, you know, tape it down with some washi tape if you want. So. Got that on. 
clean and dry off my brush. I'm gonna take my towel here and I'm just going to blot a little bit. Give myself a little bit more variation in color and texture. Plus, it won't be as much on there for it to dry. All right, that is kind of blending in nicely. If it gets too dark for you, just wipe, wash off your brush, pick up the tiniest little bit of clean water, and it will move around for you. All right. There we go. So if you were super impatient, you could take a hairdryer and dry this. We are just going to move on to another area that is not wet. Any questions so far? I don't see anything coming through. All right. And that happened to be my number six brush because I'm not working on a super big area. But you can certainly upload that picture that I have, the traceable, on the class page. And you can make it any size you want. You can do really little ones like this one here. You can see it's about half that size. Or you could do it really large if you wanted to, like the one I printed out. You could do it on like an eight by 10. That would be really, really cute. I was thinking if you painted these and then maybe you cut along this upper edge here and folded them back, they would make really, really cute place cards for Thanksgiving, you know, in your free time. So you can make 40 of those for your Thanksgiving dinner. All right. So because this is still wet, we're gonna move on to our pumpkin because there will be no wet areas touching our pumpkin. And the pumpkin, I'm using this Sennelier Orange. This is not one of the colors that comes with the set. This is one of the colors that I purchased separately from Blick. It was a nice, vibrant orange. But we are really, really gonna thin that baby out. We want this to be fairly transparent so we can layer on some colors and add some extra shadows in between the ribs of these pumpkins. I'm going to make sure that I leave the center area, the most highlighted area where you have that kind of curve of the rib. I'm going to leave that with no paint on it so we can go back and put a little bit of this bright lemon yellow to give ourselves a nice highlight. So when I have my brush really loaded up like this, I'm going to tap that extra dot off. And then that way I don't have to worry about having too much paint. If you go right onto the paper frequently, you're going to have too much paint on your brush and you're not going to be able to control it. So fill in that rib, leave this area here with no little white space there. Isn't that a pretty orange? Now you can certainly mix your own orange. This particular orange would be a combination of probably like carmine or alizarin crimson, which is similar to carmine and um, lemon yellow. But I am super lazy. I don't like mixing colors. I think it was just really nice for all of these paint companies to make all these lovely colors for us. So that way I can just go right in, use the color I want, and I don't have to try and guess how much I need when I'm mixing it. I also can do all my leaves and be the same color because I haven't mixed my green. I can do all my segments the same color with my pumpkin because I haven't tried to mix my orange. And I am not saying that there is anything wrong with that or that it's better or not, but you know, not as good. There are a lot of amazing artists who will only use the three primary colors and they mix everything else themselves. 
So there you see I've left this quite a bit lighter here and I did that just by adding more water and less pigment. That's the thing with watercolor is you are constantly adjusting the flow of the water and your saturation of your pigment is determined by how much pigment you have versus how much water you have. So I just put my color in and then I cleaned off my brush, picked up some water, and then just used the water and the pigment that was left on my brush to move it around. So we're gonna let that dry for a little bit. If we go right in now and try and put in the shadows from our segments, everything's just gonna bleed right out and you're not gonna get any type of definition whatsoever. We wanna have a little bit of contrast and a little bit of definition in between those segments. So I think what we will do next is we will work on these leaves and I'm going to be using, there's a color that's called Deep Forest in this set. And you can see it's really dark. It's a very, very dark green right there. I'm gonna add a little bit of the, they're calling it Thalo Green Light. Um, I don't think there's anything that looks Thalo Green about this, but it kind of mediums it out to kind of a nice leafy color. Once again, I'm getting lots of water in here. It's only maybe a, mm, not quite a tea, definitely a skim milk consistency. I've got this kind of drip on there. I want to get rid of that extra tap that off. That way you don't have to worry about it getting away from you. And I'm going to just fill in my leaves. Now right here, right next to that pumpkin, I don't want the two to bleed together because they are complementary colors of yellow, I mean orange and green would turn brown. So I'm just leaving the tiniest little space in between those two. All right, I want to, I'm gonna clean off my brush, wipe it off on my paper towel so I have a fairly dry brush and I'm going to pick up a little bit of a highlight on either side of the vein here. I'm so sorry about the shadows from my hand. So can you see that where I picked up a little bit of a shadow on each side? Now I'm going to pick up some of the lemon yellow and the golden yellow together. Mix those up together, makes this nice kind of rubber ducky yellow. And I'm going to put a space of that up each side. And this paper is going to blend that out for me all on its own. Now, while I have this yellow, and that orange is pretty dry, I'm going to put that yellow right on my highlight areas here. And I used equal parts of the lemon yellow and the golden yellow. And that will really pop that up. And don't worry if this still looks a little flat, we are going to go back and add in some burnt sienna and carmine for some shadows. All right, so I'm just gonna keep working on these leaves here using that mix of the, if you happen to have like a Grumbacher, I would use a Hooker's Green Dark or um, Sap Green it is always a fantastic go-to for doing leaves. Uh, I don't know if you saw, I just happened to smash my brush with a bunch of green up in my sky. And because my sky is fairly dry, I was able to just use a clean, wet brush and lift that right back off. All right, so just go ahead and paint in your leaves. Clean off your brush, 
dry off your brush and pick up a little bit of a highlight on either side there. And then go ahead and put that yellow in there. And we are also going to go back with a, a darker green and emphasize the veins in those leaves and get some shadow also where you've got some overlaps. Like on this leaf here where the one leaf is definitely in front of the other, we're going to go in and put some shadow in between the two. But for now, you can literally paint them together as one section. Seeing as though this is all in the same area, I'm just going to do all these leaves together and then I will go back and pull my highlight up. Don't forget this leaf is behind our stem. Alright, clean off my brush, dry it off, pick up just a little bit of a highlight on either side of the veins of these leaves. You see there where it didn't pick up? That means that I have too much paint on my brush from the lift, so I have to clean my brush, dry it, and come back. See now how that lifted up nicely now? This one here I'm going to leave fairly dark. Mix up a little bit of both those green, or both those yellows. didn't have enough water in them. There we go. Just a little bit up on the tip there. Okay. Now we still have more greens that we're going to be doing. We're going to be doing the back side of the flowers here, of these sunflowers. But we, there again, everything's kind of connected, so we want to let one section dry before we move on. All right, this is fairly dry down here, so we're going to put in our dirt, our land. And I'm using a combination of burnt sienna and the warm sepia. Mix that up right here. Ooh, definitely a dirt muddy brown. I'm just running that horizontally underneath the pumpkin, underneath the leaves a little bit so everything looks grounded. I'm trying, I'm actually using the side of my brush, so you kind of catch, can you see that? You can kind of catch the texture of the paper and get a little bit of a dry brush technique. And we'll also pick up some of that um, Payne's Gray, mix that in our brown to really make it dark and just tap in a little bit of that a little extra shadow and I want that dark right up underneath that pumpkin my pumpkin right now is dry enough that I don't have to worry about that bleeding in that is not, I would not want this color bleeding into my pumpkin. I think it might start to make it look a little bit like it was dying. And we definitely don't want that. So that's all there is to the, to that dirt. We have lots of white showing through. You can go ahead and clean off your brush. All right, our pumpkin is getting dry. Our leaves are still quite wet, so we are going to put in our our um, shadows for our pumpkin. So we're going to be using burnt sienna. 
and mix that in with your orange and also a little bit of carmine um, carmine is also called alizarin crimson in Cotman and in um, and Windsor Newtons it is alizarin crimson you would want to use an alizarin crimson permanent because regular alizarin crimson does not have any light fastness so you can see once again I've got a lot of paint on there if I went right onto my painting with this it would go everywhere and I wouldn't be able to control it so I'm going to just tap off that little bit of extra there and I'm going to put some of this along the edge of each one of my ribs and kind of pull it up from the bottom and pull that down all right I want even a little bit more red down here darken that up just a little bit more all right so clean off your brush tap off the excess water come back with your very light damp light damp light damp damp light brush and just blend that down there you go and we're going to do that on the outside edge of all of these ribs so i've got that mix with that my original orange with a little bit of burnt sienna and a little bit of the carmine tap off the excess on my paper towel or towel whichever you have and go ahead run it along that rib clean off your brush get rid of most of the water and just lightly go along that edge just to blend it now here once again I want that a little bit darker so I'm going to pick up a little bit more of just the carmine and because that's already pretty wet tap that in and continue to do that on all of these We definitely want to have it be a little bit darker up towards the top also because the pumpkin is kind of curving down so go ahead and use a little extra of the carmine at the top and at the bottom there and you see pumpkins nowadays in all different colors there are gray ones and blue ones and green ones so you can certainly make this any color that you like all right, I'm going to flip this over and work back out this way. Okay, clean off my brush, tap off the extra water, and pull that up. I like this little kind of raggediness I'm gonna leave that but it is completely up to you if you want a perfectly smooth transition or not clean off my brush tap it off Come back and just gently I'm using really the tiniest little bone of pressure on my brush here I don't want to get too aggressive let's get a little more red in there Keep in mind that this is going to dry quite a bit lighter so don't worry that you think you might have a little bit too much color in there 
All right, I'm thinking that's looking pretty good. I want just a little bit more carmine over on that side there. And because this paper is cotton, it's still a tiny bit damp, so I'm able to go in, add a little bit more without getting any blooms. A little darker there as well. All right, I kind of like that. I hope you guys like it too. All ready for Cinderella. All right, our leaves are drying nicely. See how much lighter our sky dried? And I do like that we've got these little extra bits of color in there. So, now let's move on and get some darker values in those leaves. So I'm going to, I did all that with my number six. I'm going to move down to my um, number three here. I've got this nice little number three. It's pretty small. And we're going to put some of the dark green down the, on the base of the leaves and up the vein. So I am, you know, if you're paint starts to get a little bit dry, go ahead and you can either re-spritz it, just add some water onto it. This green, this dark forest is really, really, really strong. So I'm going to add a fair amount of water to it. I want this to be about a little heavier than skim milk. And once again, there's a lot of paint in there for me mixing it up. I'm just going to tap it off on my paper. And now I'm going to come up the vein. I'm just using a very light pressure and these brushes have a really nice point. I'm painting in my veins. I want to kind of lift up on my pressure as I get the end of the vein and that way I should get a little point. Okay, now I'm going to take the paint that's on this brush and kind of go along my edges here. Just a little bit. And this area here would definitely be darker as it's a little bit behind our pumpkin. All right, so see that kind of looks wonky, right? Because now we're gonna go and blend it in a little bit. So now I'm gonna clean off my brush, tap off any extra water because I don't wanna to have too much water on here and I can just go back and soften those edges. and pull that in and give ourselves a little bit of depth. And just tap that in. This area underneath here is the, um, the the stems coming behind from the flowers. So those are also green. And I'm just gonna paint in some dark green stripes for now and let those dry. Um, don't have those go on top of your pumpkin because they're behind your pumpkin. So you can all go ahead and just finish filling in and doing all of your leaves. It's gonna take a sec few seconds. This is not instant. So take your time and paint in your leaves. So I have a goodly amount of my dark forest mixed up. This little brush gives me really good control. And I'm just kind of bringing it along the edge of each of my leaves. And then I'm also going to go up the center of my veins and draw those in. Now, if you don't feel comfortable doing them with this size brush, you can always use a much smaller brush. The thing about a really tiny brush is though it holds little to no paint. So you're not gonna be able to get pull a very long line. If you use a larger brush with less pressure 
and straight up and down perpendicular to the paper, you will be able to draw all day long. Okay, clean off my brush, tap it off, go along that edge of the, where the two colors meet, the lighter and darker color meets, and just blend it in. And it doesn't have to be a perfect blend on this. That kind of posterized look where you can actually see the transition between your colors, I personally really like that. I want this to be a little darker, and because it is still wet from when I did my initial blend, I can just tap in a little bit heavier saturation of paint and it is going to blend out on its own. Watercolor is super, super forgiving that way. All right. We're good somewhere. If I can just move this over just a tiny bit. Nope. I wish that I could have this up here for better light. Oh, that's better. So just go ahead and keep working on your leaves. This technique where you're putting one color on top of a mostly dry color is called glazing. It's really a common and popular technique in watercolor. You need to build up your color. You cannot do this all in one pass. I think a lot of people feel like they should be able to just do one time over and all the color and depth and all the tones will be there like they are expecting them to and that is definitely not how this medium works. You need to take your time and you need to build that up. All right, I am going to get some darker color right along this edge here because I want to have it this leaf look like it is on top and I'm just using a more concentrated mix with more pigment in it of that green because that is wet I'm just tapping that in on that wet side and it's going to naturally pull itself out and give me the shadow that I want I'm not going to do this leaf right here though for that very reason all right, let's do this little guy here. And he is mostly behind. So we can do this leaf quite a bit darker. And you want to have all your leaves a little different tone. If they're all the exact same, it'll just look really flat and boring. Okay, let's get that a little bit darker right underneath here. And because it's wet, I'm just tapping it in and letting it flow out on its own. And that will work because I've got cotton paper as well. If you're using a cellulose paper, like maybe a Canson or a Strathmore 400 or even a 300, you're going to be not getting that natural capillary action of the fibers. Now, if you feel like maybe here... I lost my highlight a little bit. I'm going to lift it up and just put in a little bit more yellow. Okay. And just tap in a little bit more of the dark there. See how it just kind of does its thing. Don't fight it. You will lose. Okay.
And now I am brightening this up with just even one more layer of yellow on some of these areas that I really want to pop them out. Just tapping that on there. I don't want it to start to look overworked. If your green is not dark enough, you can always add the tiniest little bit of Payne's Gray to it. I like using Payne's Gray instead of black because I think it's a much softer look and Payne's Gray naturally has a little bit of blue in it and that blue um, gives you really good color harmony with the green because of course green is yellow and blue together. So I deepen that up a little bit as well. Keep in mind that that is definitely going to dry lighter. Okay. So you can just lift that right back up if you have too much paint on there. Now I am liking that a whole lot better. Okay, our pumpkin is dry. I want to get that little smidge of yellow right there that I had missed. Little smidge of yellow there. Still trying to leave a little tiny bit of the white showing through, like maybe here. There I've got a little yellow, but I did leave a little bit of white because I think that white in watercolor, leaving that show through gives you the brightness from the paper underneath. Okay, I think we're looking pretty good. I'm gonna add a little bit more dark under here. And that is just Payne's Gray on a fairly dry brush. And there again, I'm using it on the side of my brush. So I'm just catching the texture of my paper. There, I like that better. Okay. All right, these leaves here are a little bit wet. So I'm gonna start on my flower here. I'm gonna actually start on the center of this flower. If you look at sunflowers, the center of them is very, very dark. Um, I'm going to mix Payne's Gray and the um, Warm Sepia, or if you had Burnt Umber, that would work as well. Very similar colors, both kind of a dark brown. Um, burnt umber is a little bit warmer sepia, even though it says it's warm sepia, it's still a little bit cooler. And I've got my brush fairly loaded up, and this is a heavier mix, so this is more like heavy cream. And I'm going to lightly tap it in around the edge of my flower center and on that little divot also. But I'm not going to do the entire center center. And if you'll notice, I left lots of little spaces of white. We're going to go back and we're going to actually put some green in there. There is um, a lot of color in the center of um, sunflowers. So we're going to put a little green and then that very, very, very center, we're going to actually do pretty black. But we don't want to do that now because if we do with that wet paint on there, it's all just going to blend together and then you're not going to have any definition. So I'm wondering if this leaf is dry enough that we can do our stem. So our stem is the same color mix of the um, warm sepia with a little bit of the gray, Payne's gray in there, but we're going to mix it a little bit more water so it's more transparent. And we're going to just work in the direction. So I did it so these, it looks like it curved and is kind of gnarly. And I'm just painting it in following the shape of the curves there and then it's got darker down at the base well you'll see I left lots of white in there I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna actually put in some burnt sienna on top of that the burnt sienna I'm using is a lot heavier mix it's more paint and less water so my paints are getting a little dried out I just gave another little spritz with my water bottle there ok 
Okay. Once again, I just kind of followed the lines. I'm going to go back with some Payne's Gray, and I'm just going to touch it down at the bottom here to really darken and get that shadow. And then follow that up. Can you see that? Okay. There's a ladybug climbing on the camera. All right. Now we're coming along. All right. This leaf here is dry enough that we can do a little bit of detail on this leaf that's in front. So I'm going to use the dark green, that dark forest and I'm going to draw in my vein. You know, and you already have that pen on there, so if you don't want to go back and draw it in with the paint, you don't have to. You can just use the pen marks that are there. Get it a little bit darker next to the pumpkin, so we have a little shadow. Cleaned and dried my brush, and I'm just pulling that out. But I want to make sure that I leave this edge here quite light, so I have a light edge next to that darker leaf there, so we have some separation. Let's pick up some of that too. I'm going to use a little bit of just the lemon yellow along this edge here. And I can't waste what I've got on my brush, you know. Just move that around a little bit. You don't have to be super, super precise because you do have those lines underneath. Let's get this darker here. I'm just gonna tap that in. Okay. Alrighty, see how that's kind of blending on its own? I'm just gonna let it do its thing. Okay, this one here is dry, so I'm gonna do this stem, and I'm going to use the a little bit lighter green that comes in this palette. It is the um, Thalo Green Light. If you don't have Thalo Green Light, you could use Sap Green with a little bit of lemon yellow in it. I am intentionally not painting in this edge up here with the green. I'm gonna go back and put pure lemon yellow on that. And then we've got this area down here, which is also, it's right there. And that's the part of the, that's holding the flower also. That's the calyx there. But it's a lot farther back, so I'm going to use some of the darker green mixed with the, the thalo, light thalo green. Just to get a little darker. I don't have a ton of paint on my brush. I don't need it. It's a small area. I'm just tapping it in. Okay, clean off my brush, pick up some of that lemon yellow. It's surprising because with watercolors, yellows are very opaque. And I'm just gonna go along that edge with the yellow. Can you see that? Can you see how that gave me some nice little separation there? I hope everybody is enjoying this. It's just a fun little project for the season. All right. I'm just going to give this all a minute or so to dry. Um, while the rest of that's drying, I'm just going to flick in some grass. I'm just going to use my leftover greens and browns and whatever I have here on my palette. You could certainly splatter this. I think that would be really cute if you did that too. I know Jan would have a freak out, but... Go ahead and splatter it if you want to. 
um, you might want to maybe cover up just take a post-it note or something and cover up the center part and splatter around it so you can control a little bit more where it's going to go or you can go for it and just do the whole thing so just doing some loose little sweeps here of some grasses give it a little bit of motion fill in some of my negative space here i want to kind of fill that in with a little bit of green also Here's that stem from our flowers. So I want to kind of emphasize that. I picked up more of that darker green. I'm also going to use some of that darker green tapped in right up along there. Just tap that in here so we can get some texture and separation. Once again, we want to have a good variety of different tones Okay, got this nice heavy dark green. I'm also gonna re-go over my, my veins here. So, like I said, key is just using your brush. Make sure that it's perpendicular straight up and down. And don't use a lot of pressure. And you'll get some nice thin lines that way. The harder you brush down on your brush, the thicker your lines will get. It's really good to practice, actually. Sometimes I'm trying to be so light with it that I'm not actually even making contact with the paper. I don't know if you notice, I always put my knuckle down. And that kind of helps stabilize me. All right. Okay. All right, while I have this green on here, I'm going to tap a few little taps of this green also on this brown. And then in that very, very center, I'm gonna use a thinned out Payne's Gray. So I want it to be dark, but I don't want it to be like a black hole. So I'm using a Payne's Gray, but I'm thinning it out a little bit so it's a little bit transparent. You see how that kind of filled in nicely there? All right. Clean that up a bit. And get those veins in on this little guy here. Too much paint. That would have gotten me in trouble. All right. Okay, I'm just gonna let everything dry for a minute or so here. And then we will paint our flowers and we'll be all done. I think it will be safe and we are going to use the lemon yellow mixed with that Naples yellow deep um, Indian yellow would work out fantastic for that too um, if you don't have in the Naples yellow deep it's really similar to yellow ochre or a golden yellow so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to start from the inside of my petals and kind of only paint about halfway out and don't paint the tips. We're going to go back and we're going to blend that out, but we want to have more color towards 
the center of where it would, what would be the center of the flower itself. Can you see that, how I've got, I did not paint all the way to the end of the flower petal. Okay, clean off my brush, pick up just the tiniest little bit of water, and I'm just gonna pull that, pull those all to the outside. I'm gonna do a few, I'm gonna clean off my brush, and then I'm gonna do it again, because I don't wanna have too much, if you, keep doing it all with the same brush and you never clean your brush off again. It's going to um, keep actually picking paint up from the paper and the painting and you will end up with more paint on your brush than if you'd actually loaded it up. And just use a soft text, light pressure, a little bit of clean water. And there again, I am not going to the very, very tippy edge. I just want to leave a little bit of white highlight on the edge. Can you see that? Can you see that? There we go, that's better. All right, now I'm going to use a little bit of the burnt -y orange color that we used in the pumpkin, which was the orange, the raw se or burnt sienna, and carmine. I have a little bit of that now. Do you see this? That little drip there? Do you see that little drip on my brush? If you don't get rid of that, that drip is going to come all the way down to the tip of your brush and go onto your paper and make a nice big splash. And it will actually move your paint away from where you had painted it. So always make sure that you clean off any errant drips. Okay. I am just doing the tiniest little bit at the very center most area of the petal. Okay, I'm gonna go back and soften that, so don't, don't think I have lost my mind, at least not too much this time. So I'm just putting in my color right now and then I will go back and blend it out a little bit. my brush sunflowers just like pumpkins come in all sorts of colors some of them are really orange some of them are almost brown, some of them are really, really yellow. Um, so you can certainly do any color that you like. They, I think, are the quintessential end of summer kind of flower. There we go, get rid of that. Now I'm coming from the outside in with a little bit of just lemon yellow. Once again, I'm trying to leave some white space in between Kind of cute. Got a little bit of yellow out there. Like I said, yellow is a little bit more opaque, so you can actually tap a little bit on top of darker colors and it will stay in show. So I'll do that around the edge there. I might bump up this edge here a little bit of that leaf. Define the edge a little bit more with this leaf.
All right. I just let that dry for a few seconds and I kind of like it. I hope you guys do too. Now, if you want, you can always go and go back with your pen if you want to tighten up any of your lines. They weren't really meant to be like a, it's not really a true pen and ink. I just thought if we put those in to start with that, um, it would give you kind of a guideline and I think a lot of times people will feel more comfortable with that. But now that you have the pattern, you can do it without doing the pen if you want. Or when you're transferring your pattern, you can also, um, if you draw real heavily, it will leave a very, very dark line and you could use that as your kind of outline instead of going back over it with the pen. So I wanted that a lot darker there. Let's get a few little grass blades coming up. A few more maybe from here. So we have some different tones. Okay, alrighty there. A little extra yellow on this petal here. And I think we are done. I hope you guys enjoyed this. So there you go. Don't forget to sign it. So you can see how adorable that is super cute and you can get pre-made cards and pre-cut card stock from Amazon, Michaels, wherever. And you could just mount that on. See how cute that would be? You could cut this off if you wanted and center it and then it's a perfect 5x7 and you can frame it in a ready-made 5x7 frame if you want. Um, you could put it on the orange. Would be really cute. So, don't forget to sign your work. And thanks so much for tuning in. And hopefully you guys will leave some comments so I will know if you liked doing this or not. And we could possibly do it again. So, have a good night and enjoy your weekend. Thanks. Bye.